Hey, welcome back, everyone, to the Progressive Brothers Podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Renaissance Man. Hey, welcome back, to everyone. Episode number 100. Uh, please like the video. Um, peace to everyone in the chat and subscribe to the channel. Also, make sure you follow us on Twitter at Brothers underscore podcast. So a lot has been happening the last week or so in regards to Justice Kintanji uh, Brown Jackson. And here you have a woman, a black woman, woman of color, who is now been cleared by the Senate to actually uh, serve on the bench um, for the Supreme Court. What's your take on KBJ in terms of uh, her serving as the Supreme Court Justice? Yeah, so um, I thought it to be pretty... Uh pretty uh pretty straightforward in my mind um this in my mind was a very safe pick from biden despite all of the uh, all the circuits and uh theatrics that kind of went around it um there was some controversy uh in in some of the confirmation hearings around some of her some first sentence sentencing um in previous cases but um a lot of things that weren't really discussed there was uh when you look at actually the sentencing guidelines and then how they're saying, oh, she differed from the sentencing guidelines. But if you actually look at the, uh, I believe it's the probation officer's uh, report and the pre-sentencing report that they actually issue, uh, see actually, if you go and look at those things, which they did not look at during the hearing, she was actually in line on five of the seven. And then the other two that she wasn't in line, she wrote, I believe in her opinion, discussing how they needed to revise the statutes, um, not to get too far in depth, but basically, the, the sentencing guidelines were basically given in a time um, when we were, had very immature technology surrounding those types of cases. And now that technology has matured, there needed to be more um, more nuance in the guidelines to, to account for um, different uh, what they call enhancements in the law. So, you know, there was a little, little bit of a sideshow around that. And then obviously the question around um, she was getting to, given on defining what a woman was. Um, what a lot of people don't realize on that is that was definitely a gotcha question by Marsha Blackburn. Uh, what she was really trying to get at was um, there are cases going through the courts right now that are dealing with that issue. Um, and if uh, if Kentaji could have act, would have actually gone in and given her opinion, uh, she could have tainted uh, her her uh, her opinions in the case, and she could be in a situation. Uh, kind of like Clarence Thomas is in where you the right thing would be to recuse yourself. So that's why you heard the, basically the non response from her. She was she was obviously not trying to put herself in that situation. Um, and that's why it was a gotcha question anyway, because no, everyone knows that someone who's nominated for the Supreme Court is going to be able to find at least in, in layman's terms what a woman is. But this goes back to the distinction of when you look at the how we use language day to day and how we use it in the law. Um, it's two different things, and uh, if people aren't aren't aware of that nuance, and you know, it just creates uh, basically a culture war for Republicans. But you know, I think it's a big win. She's she's obviously one of the most qualified people that they've actually the most qualified uh, that has been nominated to the Supreme Court. I think they I saw a little uh, chart that actually compared all of her credentials, uh, looking at um, like things like clerking from a just for a justice, went to a, a uh, Ivy League school. Uh, also went to a public, uh, got a public education as well, too, uh, in high school. So, you know, bringing that sort of intersection as well into. And then I believe it was also um, being a federal appeals court judge as well. So she okay. when you when you line them up across the line, she was the most qualified um, person they've had nominated. So I, I think it's a big win for Biden. I think it's definitely something that they can run on um, as a big win. And, and honestly, it, it may be one of the last big wins he has of his administration. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm glad you brought up the point about gender because it's a liberal, you know, sort of litmus test for them, for the for the conservatives to determine whether or not how liberal she is and how liberal is she going to serve on what they consider to be the last bastion of conservatism, which is the Supreme Court. And so to throw that out there and, and, and you know, put a tripwire by, by, you know, interjecting, you know, gender into the conversation, knowing that, um, you know, knowing that she cannot answer and she would have to recuse herself anyways, you know, it, it's just one of those things to, to create controversy within the, um, the culture warriors. 
you know, I've seen many black men actually jump out there and say, I can't believe she didn't answer the question. Well, why would she answer the question? <laughs> like, if you actually listen to the whole conversation, even with uh, Senator Kennedy um, for from uh, Louisiana, you know, he even kind of threw it out there that I don't want to put you on the spot to make a decision. And then she responds like, well, you actually are putting me on the spot to, uh, to make a decision and I'm not going to answer that question. And so they threw everything they could um, in terms of like the conservative bombs at her um, and, and this sort of waterboarding treatment on, on the panel. But I think Cory Booker kind of stole the show. I think his presentation and his uh, adulation for her it was something that no one really had expected, but I think he performed really well. Now, here's the thing about Cory Booker on this, and I don't want to spend too much time on Cory Booker. But Senator Booker teed himself up for something else. When he sold all the adulation for uh, Ketanji Brown, um, a lot of black women really jumped out there for him. You know, they celebrated, you know, his praising of her. I think that is going to set him up for 2024, something later on down the line. Because he can hang his hat on this as well. Now, who takes a real big L in this is Tim Scott. Because Tim Scott did not support her on this. When the one opportunity that he had to do it, he didn't do it. He took one for the team. Yeah, yeah, that looks really bad. I, I misspoke a second ago. She was actually a public defender and she was on the sentencing commission. Those are the two things that um, no one yeah. on the court had. But to your point about Tim Scott and Republicans in general, yeah. um, <laughs> it's crazy. Tim Scott didn't vote for this woman, but yeah. I believe it was Susan Collins, uh, Mitt Romney, and was it wasn't Murkowski, was it? The third one that crossed over and voted as well? I think I, I forget right now. I think uh, I think it was those three. Um, yeah. But, you know, the fact that, you know, Lindsey Graham, he, he didn't, and then he actually has been running an ad um, because he, he wanted Michelle Child to be everyone to really put someone on the bench to begin with. So he's actually running an ad uh, bashing her, which, once again, doesn't help. the. I don't see how that's going to help the Republican Party with the black vote. Um, and then, like I said, like you said, Tim Scott not supporting her. You know, what's what's her rationale? The, the one thing that's lost in all this is, um, you know, she was just nominated to, I believe, to the federal court either a year or two years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lindsey Graham and several other Republicans voted for her. Um, as well as actually, actually, after you had the confirmation in the vote, you actually had some Republicans like Ted Cruz, um, I believe Josh Hawley. Those people actually walked out um, as she was getting an ovation. So it, 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 it playing to their base. They have yeah. to play to the base because the base is inherently what <laughs> they're inherently racist. They're white supremacists. They are white nationalists. That is how they operate. And so. They didn't have that same smoke for Kavanaugh. Oh, no. Right? They didn't have that same smoke for Amy Comey Barrett. And Kentaji is more qualified than ACB is. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Right? Head and shoulders. Right? But no one ever questions the legitimacy of that. They just only question the legitimacy of Kentaji uh, Brown Jackson. And so her Harvard background, Harvard is... I won't get into the IR thing. I, I don't want to get into that, but I'll say that to another stream. But that's what they produce. That's the sort of, you know, by, she's a byproduct of that Cambridge uh, base. You know, I, I live not too far away from Cambridge, so I'm pretty well aware of the sort of, um, you know, political and, and judicial figures that, um, you know, these institutions produce. You know, AOC is a, uh, a graduate of BU, um, you know, uh, Obama came out of Harvard as well. You know, uh, many, many of your, uh, yeah, Barrett's, Democratic the, yeah. Barrett's the only one on the court who's not from the Ivy league. So yeah, you're, you're right in the middle of all that. Yeah. Yeah. And so they, it, they produce these sort of figures. So I'm well aware that that was going, you know, he was going to have to choose somebody and he already kind of had it in his mind who he's going to go after. Um, and it was a great move on, on Biden's behalf. Because Campaign this, promise. Yeah. He he let, he can say, 
I, I held, um, I, you know, uh, I kept my word on supporting the black community and also supporting this. Now, I think the next step is, the, you know, George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, but that's a whole nother discussion for another time. I think that um, this is going to tee them up for November. Um, they can go in with, because she takes office and, and uh, or she takes the bench in July. And so they're going to go, they're going to have full steam going into November with this. The other thing is, I think, is it's a lasting uh, sort of impact. Uh, that's what I always thought when it when it came out was that this is an instance where things like policies people tend to forget, uh, especially if it's nothing massive. Uh, I think I saw polling that like talked about if you went back to um, and looked at the American Rescue Plan and looked at the stimulus checks that came out. You know, a lot of people couldn't even remember either getting them or or you know which party passed it because i mean these things don't last long in in political life the majority of people i i believe or a large portion um this is something you can constantly point to um for the next you know 30 40 years of hey this is a lasting legacy it's always someone who whether it be you know when she's writing an opinion or you know if there's a sound bite that you can always kind of point to is hey you know this is really lasting change it's it's almost like people can point to obama as a black president but that's only eight years this is something like i said you can point to for the next 30 to 40 and the power of voting and you know what what a what a, a swing state like georgia really means for all this yeah absolutely you know um we'll see you know if justice thomas has to step down maybe at some point it within by by this tenure he steps down does that allow biden to actually serve up another justice i i will be a little bit cynical and say um i i think i i think what this has signaled with the walkout of the republicans and the on the few voters support support that she got is how politically charged this process has become um i didn't realize this but someone pointed this out to me the other day clarence thomas was actually confirmed by a democratic congress um, and I believe I believe RBG was confirmed by a Republican Congress. So these things, which used to be uh, not as um, as much of a spectacle and not so partisan driven, it, it's it's made a complete 180 in literally probably the past 30 to 40 years. And just how partisan these things are. And, you know, however, the next appointment comes about. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me, say, you know, uh, Clarence Thomas, for whatever uh, reason, is uh is impeached you know depending on how far the rabbit hole goes with these text messages mm -hmm. uh you know I, I could see republicans if they have their way not letting there be another vote on a justice till you have your next president your next presidential election um you know letting the court essentially go with with six justices um i'm sorry not not, not six justices um eight justices mm -hmm. and basically they run the potential of a tie because i, I just think that's how partisan it's gotten yeah, absolutely. Now, switching gears, um, Amir Locke. So the officer involved in the shooting of Amir Locke in a no-knock warrant, no charges would be pressed against him, um, according to Attorney General Keith Ellison. And so a lot of people were like, you know, this is similar to Breonna Taylor. You know, how can this happen again? You know, why... Why, why aren't they charging them? And the reality is statute, Minnesota statute, um, I'm sorry, uh, Minnesota statute 609.66 um, basically stipulates that authorized use of deadly force by peace officers, deadly force defined, uh, well, I won't read that, um, I'll just read this part. Uh, the legislature, legislature hereby finds and declares the following. One, that the authority to use deadly force conferred on peace officers by this section is a critical responsibility that shall be exercised judiciously and with respect for human rights and dignity and for the sanctity of every human life. The legislature further finds and declares that every person has a right to be free from excessive use of force by officers acting under the color of the law. 
So what they're saying essentially is that the use of deadly force was justified with Amir Locke primarily because he picked up this firearm and he pointed it at law enforcement as they entered his uh, entered the place of residence where he was staying. Now, the backstory on this is that Amir Locke was not the primary um, tenant under on, on, at the residence. He he was actually staying there temporarily, um, and they were actually looking for a relative of his who may have been involved allegedly in some other incidents. Um, to hear you have a black 22 year old black male who was sleeping on the couch and watching Netflix and chilling. And you had these people come into the house, law enforcement, no knock warrant, put the keys into the lock and, and, and force their way in. And you hear, all, you hear all these footsteps coming in. He grabs his firearm and he decides that he's going to defend himself uh, against whatever is coming through that door. Um, the question that a lot of people have was, well, did he have a permit or a license to actually possess that firearm? In this situation, according to Attorney General Keith Ellison, that's irrelevant to the decision that they made on whether or not the use of deadly force was justified. And so a lot of your right wing conservatives, your pessimists who came in and said, well, you know, he shouldn't have had a gun. Newsflash. Castle Doctrine allows you to possess a firearm in your house of in your house of state, whether it's temporary or permanent. He had a right to own that firearm. He had a right to possess it. That ends all discussion from a lot of these, uh, you know, far right conservatives that want to make it seem like a black man with a gun is somehow something that we, that we need to actually question. But when Kyle Rittenhouse had that gun, no one wanted to really have that conversation. They wanted to say that well, he was stopping you know, whatever he was trying to stop. So he was justified in using that deadly force for him. But for Amir Locke, the question is whether or not he had full possession of the gun under the under the uh, jurisdiction of Minneapolis or Minnesota for that matter. So what's your take on Amir Locke? Uh, I'm surprised this happened again. Uh, you know, I, I figured with George Floyd, Minnesota would have... Uh, would have really looked at some of these laws and just the possibility because you, you don't want anything like that from the negative attention and the fact that it was a no knock warrant again uh the fact that we had a brianna taylor case uh i believe there was was it even Rand paul that introduced a bill in the in this uh, in the senate to ban no knock warrants across the board uh, I think like he introduced for, i think he introduced one uh for kentucky but i'm not sure if it was across the board Oh, okay, okay. It may have just been uh, one for, for, or tried to put one in the Kentucky legislature. But yeah, that that's what the thing that's surprising to me is that here we find ourselves in another situation where uh, split second decision, uh, no knock warrant, you no know, someone sleeping. So once again, someone banging on your door, just you 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 do what any sort of human, your fight or flight takes over it at that time. You do what. What any sort of person would do when someone's entering their home and they're, they're especially not announcing themselves um and it's just it, it's crazy to me that there is no uh there's no legality around it um as far as any sort of uh banning of banning of because i think the whole practice in general i mean it, it's a byproduct of the war on drugs which it seemed like we had been shifting over time and and actually you know the house just the other day actually passed a bill um legalizing and decriminalizing marijuana you know i'm, I'm sure it's going to die in the senate but th that shifts the that shows that the attitudes have shifted on things like the war on drugs over time and i thought we could really nip some of this in the butt some of these uh, laws that have come about but uh it is unfortunate that these things are still there just because i i think you're going to see more instances like this it's it's just a situation that, you know, like I said, any rational person, someone enters your home uh, unannounced and you're sleeping of all things, you, you're going to react. You're going to do whatever you need to do to defend yourself. And um, it, it's just it's it's unnecessary death. Um, and it's crazy to me that you actually had conservatives of all people uh, mm -hmm. trying to say that yeah, you shouldn't have a firearm because, I mean, this is not even conceal and carry. This is literally, you know, someone within their home with a with That's a firearm. Right. 
So it, 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 you're not even going like yeah, like I said, castle doctrine. You're not even going to even just being out with your firearm. You're just people owning fire homes in their own home. I mean, who, plenty of people have that. So it's just crazy to me that that was the argument that came out instead of just saying, hey, you know, uh, police were in the wrong, and even more so. Uh, the legislature needs to correct this to make these uh, sort of procedures illegal to begin with, because all the training in the world is not going to fix something like that. Definitely. You would think that the NRA would come out and say something, but we haven't heard the NRA come out and say anything, right? Oh, no, <laughs> not at all. And, and don't anticipate it. I mean, we saw what happened in Minnesota again with Philando Castile in the NRA. This is uh, uh they're, they're very selective on who and when they're going to come out and support uh, gun rights. Yeah, definitely. It, it's, and to kind of tie this up, it's the judge, uh, the George Floyd Justice and Police Act would actually have helped in this case. Because Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and so that's why these things are important. A lot of people want to dismiss it and say, well, you know, George Floyd, he died from, you know, some, uh, an eight ball of coke or whatever it is or fentanyl or whatever it is and at the end of the day malpractice is malpractice <laughs> when yeah, it comes it, to law enforcement they seem to they seem to think that that doesn't apply to them the, the other thing with, comes to, with the argument that I don't think people really get in this is going to be even if you want to come out if you want to throw the uh, morality and everything else out the financial aspect of this because um, despite these officers not being charged um, I'm pretty sure his family is going to get a very large settlement behind this because of the the way this was conducted. I mean, look at what Breonna Taylor, I believe she got one of the largest settlements I know within the state of Louisville. It may have been one of the larger ones for uh, police in general. Um, yeah. I can't remember off the top of my head, but, you know, that was a result of, of you know, a, basically a botched uh, uh, no-knock warrant. So, I mean, here's another instance where, you know, not on... Uh, not only has uh, a young man lost his life, but um, there's, there's the taxpayers are going to be on the hook for any sort of liability that I'm sure the police are going to incur. Um, and the sad part, too, about this is my understanding was he was only staying there temporarily. I believe he was getting ready to move to Houston pretty yeah, he, within the next couple weeks before this occurred. He was actually an artist. Okay. His father was an actual recording artist, too. And so he was kind of carrying on that tradition. And so I, 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 according to Attorney General Keith Ellison, he had every right to possess a firearm and he didn't have any criminal, at least no negative criminal history that would have prevented him from carrying a firearm or possessing a firearm in the first place. So all of this sort of over scrutinization of him to make it seem like, oh, well, you know, he did have that gun you know did he legitimately have it no one had that same sort of questioning line of questioning for like uh you know uh, uh kyle rittenhouse when he had it. well well kyle was defending himself but when it came to amir uh, lock it was just like well you know i don't know about that guy now when it came to Fernando castile it was well you know he was reaching for his driver's license should have stayed still <laughs> there's all these sort of you know, pushback against the legitimacy of agency for black men. Um, and it's sad to hear it coming from other black men as well, more so than the uh, white conservatives who think that um, the law is justified um, or can be decided, you know, on the street or in, or in their hands for that matter. So any last thoughts? Uh, yeah, just on the part on, on the black conservatives, the ironic thing is uh uh, a lot of these white conservatives would they'd be at there'd be an uproar about a, a situation like that if the tables were turned They're, they that is not going to be viewed as acceptable for police to enter their house um unannounced and then them react in their sleep um not even really react just have a have a weapon and then because they had a weapon or reaching for it um being killed that they they would never defend something like that so like you said it's just crazy to me that you have um, black conservatives who, who want to defend this narrative because it's, it like I said, it, it's right to defend yourself is one of the main things that conservatives um, really rally around as, as a real rallying cry for people on the right. So it just it just shows how much of a disconnect there is, and and uh, repression from the from the government, right? Absolutely, government. absolutely. 
Like, share, and subscribe. Make sure you follow us on Twitter at Brothers underscore Podcast.